Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening upon, uh, 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 on this uh, uh, program in which we encourage anyone to call at all with whatever question? Now, in my role as host of this program, I will try to tie your question into the Bible wherever possible because the Bible is the authoritative Word of God. It is right from the mouth of God. And we on this program have a marvelous opportunity to talk together about this most magnificent, this most glorious Word that God has given us. And you know, it's very significant when we read it, the Bible in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, Mark chapter 1, verse 15, when Jesus began officially to preach the Gospel, we read in verse 15, uh, verse 14, J Jesus came into Galilee preaching the Gospel of the Kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the Kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And do you know that is exactly the same announcement that we should be making today? That is the big command that we are to send into the world today. What is the gospel when he says, believe the gospel? Well, the gospel is the whole word of God. It is the Bible from cover to cover that came right from the mouth of God. What does it mean to believe the gospel? It means to recognize that is truth. That is the word of God. And I better try to be obedient to what God is saying here. Now, just ahead of this, he said, repent ye. And repent means that you are sinners. You are sinners. And, and now is that the kingdom of God is at hand and and is fulfilled, and indeed in our day it is about to be fulfilled in the ultimate sense because we are only a very few years away from the very end of this world and the end of sending out the gospel into this world. If there were ever a time this command has real substance, it is in our day. The time, the announcement we have to make to the world, and this is what Family Radio is all about. That's really what this program is all about, is that we want to tell the world, repent, turn away from your sins, and listen to what the Bible is saying. Believe what God is saying in the whole Bible, namely that we're sinners, we're under the wrath of God. And because of our sins, we're going to be standing for the judgment throne to answer for our sins. But in addition, as you uh, read the Bible, you'll find that there is a possibility of salvation. There is a possibility that... Uh, that you too might become saved if you're not already saved because God tells us in his gospel that there is a great multitude which no man can number that are being saved and, and only God knows who they are and it's God's business to do the saving but the Bible also as we read the gospel uh, listen to the gospel and believe what God is saying God says that we are to uh, we are to plead for mercy. We are to cry to God for salvation. We are to seek salvation. And we do so as we cry to God for mercy, uh, trying our, to do the will of God, uh, fully recognizing that anything we do will not make a contribution to our salvation, but that we are, uh, that we do have the possibility that we too that I too, if I'm not already saved, can become saved. And so that is the message that we in Family Radio want to proclaim to the world. Repent, repent, because the kingdom of God is at hand and believe the gospel. It's exactly the same message that Jesus was 
uh, bringing here or talking about when he began to bring the gospel here uh, as we read it in Mark chapter 1. And how wonderful it is, how wonderful it is that God warns us and how wonderful it is that we have the encouragement and the hope that, that I too can become saved because God has promised and absolutely committed himself to the fact that out of this world today there's a great multitude that no man can number there are being saved. And it isn't because they become experts in the Word of God. That's not the reason. It isn't because they learn a whole lot of facts from the Bible. That isn't the reason. The reason is that God in His mercy has has uh, has decided to save them and and has uh, and and uh, they in turn uh, have come into the to the arena where God is doing the saving faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God and so as they're trying to believe the gospel and 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 repent of their sins not, not, none of these things will contribute to their salvation, but it does put them in an environment where God is saving. And so uh, this is what we want to uh, emphasize again and again. But this is your program. We want to hear from you. So shall we take our first call tonight? Please, good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Yes. Yes. Uh, I have a question. It, it sounds maybe I've, I've never been asked this. Uh, you know, today video games are very popular. <clears throat> and, you know, I'm trying to live a more holy life. And it's just God has put it on my heart. But I've been single for 10 years. So I find myself watching sports and maybe going once in a while to see a movie. Maybe I shouldn't. R-rated. But these video games... You shoot people or you do adventures and you might have to like have sword fights where there's a little blood, maybe a little gore involved. And I, I'm, you know, I don't know where I should draw it. But no, I, well, but it, the, the problem I, is you have to attack this problem from the biblical vantage point. What does God tell us in his gospel? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, when you turn your computer on, you're going to watch uh, or play a video game. Start asking yourself serious questions before you proceed any further. If the Lord Jesus was present with me in my room today, would I gladly encourage him to play this game with me? Is that really something that I can glorify God with? And that's the beginning point. In other words, you have to look at yourself very honestly. Already, just by the nature of your question, you have serious doubts. You, your conscience is bothering you unquestionably. And, and you know, when our conscience begins to bother us, and if we don't feel good about something, don't do it. Don't do it. Or what is happening is, is that you are spending more and more of your time in this, and these games are designed to captivate you, to really get you snared in. And, and are they to the glory of God? Not one ounce, not a single bit. That is simply the world in action. And so I think you'll have a really hard time justifying the idea that I can play these video games and spend so much time on TV, watching TV and going to movies and so on, and claim that I am living to the glory of God. Question? Can I ask you one more question? Yeah. Okay. When you say, when in doubt, leave it out, could you briefly explain that, maybe biblically? Well, or? you know, when, when we are in doubt of something, it's because... There is a little voice in us that we call a conscience. God calls it our conscience that is tickling us and saying, Now, wait a minute, is that really wise? Is that really something you ought to do? And, and, uh, and the safe thing at that point, if you don't know, if you have no other advice to follow, don't continue because uh, trust your conscience at that point. Now, it may be that afterwards you are going to 
begin to think about this again and pray for wisdom and you're going to try to analyze why uh, you are uh, troubled by it but normally you're on the safe side if you don't press something where you're where you're beginning to get a little uneasy whether this is pleasing to God or not okay well thank you and I just want to tell you uh, to these last days I guess just listen to family radio and read your Bible and that's about it well is there anything more important than trying to get closer to God trying to learn more about the kingdom of God given the fact that first of all uh, millions of people are going to be dying tonight and tomorrow and it could be me too it could be you too and the moment we die our eternal destiny is see is sealed so whether christ was going to actually end this world in a few years or not uh, in any case where we have to take ourselves very seriously are we ready to meet god uh, and and uh, so we want to be sure that we are tr trying to draw as close to as possible to god uh, uh, begging that maybe i too maybe 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 god in his mercy will save me too because you know uh, it's in this life that uh, that it all is finished in other words when christ comes or when we die our destiny our eternal destiny is sealed and if we die unsaved or if he returns and we're still unsaved it means we're guaranteed we're guaranteed to spend eternity in hell and so it is super serious at any time in history and even far more serious in our time uh, because we're so close to the very end of the world that we uh, recognize the big important thing is is my relationship with God and the only and, and uh, let me say it the other way the wonderful thing is is that God has given us the Bible the Word of God that can tell us about the kingdom of God and tell us how we are to live and and, and encourage us to cry to God for his mercy Apart from the Bible, everything's a waste. Ultimately, we're just passing time apart from the Bible. Ultimately, we're just marking time because uh, it, uh, it's uh, all the money we earn, all the pleasure we receive, whatever it is, the adulation of friends or uh, people, all of that is temporary, tentative. Uh, it won't bless us one ounce insofar as eternity is concerned. And really, really, uh, the little bit of time we have left on this earth, uh, whether we only had four years or whether we had 400 years, it's still only a little bit of time compared with an eternity on the other side of the grave. And, uh, and uh, so it is super important. So it's that, all ash. That it's all that. It's all ash. It's all the Bible. ash. You, you've got it. It's all ashes. Finally. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hey, Mr. Camming, how you doing this evening? Very well, thank you. Yeah, this is uh, Tim Clayton calling from Eastern Maryland. Uh, let's go to the book of Habakkuk. Chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. Habakkuk. Habakkuk, chapter 2, verses 10 through 14. We read, Thou hast consoled shame to thy house by cutting off many people, and hast sinned against thy soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall, and a beam out of the timber shall answer it. Woe to him that buildeth a town with blood, and establisheth a city by iniquity. Behold, it is not of Jehovah of hosts that the people shall labor in the very fire, and the people shall weary themselves for their vanity. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Jehovah as the waters cover the sea. Now here, like God has done, has said very frequently uh, in the Bible, on the one hand, he is 
is indicating his wrath upon those who have uh, mocked the Bible, who are not listening to the Bible, who have set up their own kind of a salvation plan, uh, which can only bring death. They, they are shedding man's blood because they're encouraged, be, encouraging people to uh, trust in a gospel that can never bring salvation. And then God turns right around and says that at some point, and now, and we know from the rest of the Bible, that point is right now, that the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of Jehovah as the waters cover the sea. And that literally is happening as we're able to herald, send out the gospel all over the world through a means such as family radio. Okay, well, the peace of the Lord be with you, Mr. Campin. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, hello. Thank you for uh, taking my call. Uh, I have a, a two-part question. Uh, but before I ask, I was wondering if you could go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Yes. Uh, verses 16 through 19, please. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 16. Uh, let, let's start with verse 15. Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no matter of similitude on the day that the Lord, that Jehovah spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flieth in the earth, the likeness of anything that creepeth on the ground, the likeness of, likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and to serve them, which Jehovah thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. But now what is your question? Well, it, it's, it's two part. Um, the, the first part is, uh, can you talk about um, if I wanted to wear uh, a cross on a necklace or carry a cross with me in my pocket or um, have the form of a cross maybe on, um, you know, small on a piece of clothing, then the second part is, um, if I wanted to build a little bit of an altar in my home and I wanted to do my praying and my uh, study um, uh, before that, can I have a cross, um, you know, like hanging on the wall and things like that? Well, you see, the problem is you are looking at that cross as some kind of a spiritual icon, some kind of a spiritual sense, uh, symbol that is... Uh, reminding you of Christ or reminding you of the gospel or something of that nature. And we don't worship that way. The Bible says we worship in spirit and in truth. It is like, uh, like uh, that's exactly what this is talking about in Deuteronomy 4, uh, where people want to see their God. And so they have decided that, uh, that uh, uh, the, uh, the calf, is their God. So they make an image of a calf, or they decide and uh, some other animal is their God, and so they make an image of that animal. Why? Because they want to see something with their eyes. Or they look at the stars, and they begin to think, oh my, maybe that is, uh, it makes, uh, has some control over my life. And But they can see these things, and and that is the nature of man. They want a God that they can manage, that they can look at, that they can take the measure of. But the God that we serve is an infinite God. He is, a, he is spirit. And we worship him in spirit and in truth. We, we, uh, we're not to try to, uh, to, uh, to make some kind of an object that reminds us of God. We're to look into the Bible and read from the mouth of God what God himself says about himself. And then we can begin to pray uh, to this God whom we cannot see except through the words of the Bible. And, and anything we go, anytime we go beyond that with a cross or with an, some kind of a physical altar of some kind, we're going to get, get into trouble. 
Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. How you doing, Brother Campion? My name is Nathaniel. I have a two-part question for you, please. Yes. Uh, my first part is I went to church this past Sunday, and uh, eight, actually every single minister in the church speaks in tongues. So I'm just a little, you know, I want to clarify if that's um, a thing that goes on today or if it's something I should be wary about. Wait a minute. I, I don't quite understand. Excuse me. I don't understand your question. You want to clarify what about the church? I want to clarify. Just clarifying, you know, because I, in, in certain chapters or certain parts of the Bible, it says about speaking in tongues, um, not to add on to the Bible, but in every every minister in my church now currently speaks in tongues. So is that is God... Well, know? that's because the church you belong to is has nothing to do with the Bible. They have chosen certain verses of the Bible to use as an, uh, to try to give them some kind of biblical authority for what is going on. But they, uh, it's an entirely different gospel because they start with some verses of the Bible and then add to it the voices that, the, the words they hear through visions or voices or tongues which they believe are coming from the mouth of God. So their authority is very different than the Bible alone and in its entirety. In fact, it is a gospel that Satan himself has erected, and it has drawn a great many, many people all over the world into that kind of a gospel. So they fondly think that they have the evidence of salvation when they speak in a tongue or when they fall over backwards, uh, in some kind of a mysterious way, uh, the miracle has happened in their life, and so they think that's the evidence of salvation, and all of this is of Satan. It says Jesus spoke in Matthew 24 that false prophets and false Christs will arise with signs and wonders, and that's one of the dominant uh, ways in the world in which that particular prophecy has come to realization. You know, the okay. fact is that that any church today is actually under the authority of Satan because God has established him as the ruler there. And God, therefore, has commanded those who are interested in, in wanting to obey God, get out, get out. Uh, and, and more than that, God himself has indicated in any church, any denomination, whether they're interested in tongues or not, that uh, the Holy Spirit is not there at all to apply the word to anybody's heart, the, to save anybody. Uh, it's only outside of the churches, uh, completely un, unrelated to any local congregation, that God is still doing a mighty work of salvation. So the question... Uh, the question also, Brother Camping, I'm sorry for interrupting. Um, in the book of Acts, they talked about tongues. And we wanted to make sure, because we know back before the Bible was closed, in the book of Revelation, people were using tongues to bring new revelation from God. Well, that was true. That was true. We read that in First Corinthians chapter 14. There were a few people in the church at Corinth who received divine messages and uh, in an unknown language called a tongue, and others were qualified to interpret that so that it would, that message would edify the congregation once it was understood. But or, 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 and that was possible in that day because the Bible was not yet completed. But about 30 or 40 years later, the Bible was finished. God came to the last chapter and said, If anyone adds to the words of the prophecy of this book, I will add to him the plagues written herein. And that is the law of God. That came from the mouth of God. That meant that that phenomenon in the church at Corinth would not go along any longer. It meant that no apostle, no true believer would ever again receive a message directly from God. From that point on, the one place we can look for the Word of God is, and the only place, is the Bible, the whole Bible. 
and and that's that's the Bible that we use today, the same Bible that was completed about two thousand years ago, and that is the whole message. We're never, never, because the moment you get outside of that, you become, you get, you fall right into the hands of Satan, because Satan can break the silence between the supernatural and the natural, and he is more than pleased to captivate your interest by giving you some kind of a, a message in a dream or a vision or a tongue so that you think you're getting it from God. And by so doing, you, by the Bible's own definition or own commandment, you are, are still, therefore, subject to the plagues written here. Namely, you are still subject to judgment day and eternal damnation. Okay, one more question, please. Yes. In the book of Mark, um, chapter 5, yes. on verses um, 38 through 40, where Jesus went to heal this girl who was dead, and um, I'll wait for you to get to that chapter. Well, in the, uh, there we read, he came to the house of this ruler of the synagogue, and and uh, uh, the, there was a... Uh, there was a ruler of a synagogue who had a daughter who uh, he came to Jesus asking that he might heal her and uh, and before Jesus healed her he she died she died and so uh, but he still went to her, this ruler's house and and he found there all the people weeping and wailing because this daughter had died and when he has come in, he saith unto them, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. Well, uh, yes, she was physically dead. But Jesus is going to show that he, she is actually like someone who is sleeping because he's going to raise her from the dead. That's God's because Christ is God. And so... When he had put them all out of the house, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Tabitha kumi, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And straightway the damsel arose and walked. Right, so the question we have is, why did Jesus put out the other people out of the room before he actually brought the girl back to life? It's That's God's business. I, I, I don't know offhand why he did. Uh, excuse me, but we got to pause for this message. We had a caller who raised a question which I didn't answer uh, 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 as w carefully as I could have. In Mark chapter 5, when we read about Christ raising from the dead this young girl, she was 12 years of age, he only went into the room to do this with his three of his apostles and with the mother and father. And then after he raised her from the dead, he said these words in verse 43 of Mark 5. He charged them straightly that no man should know it. Now, we find as Jesus was ministering the gospel and healing people and raising people from the dead and so on, every now and then he would make that statement to the individual that from whom he cast out the demons or he raised from the dead or say healed from some devastating illness. Don't tell anybody about it. And the, at least we know this, that Christ had a, there was a very, very definite day and year when Christ was to go to the cross. He also knew full well that, that the Pharisees who were extremely jealous of him and who hated his uh, gospel altogether would be the instruments in God's hand actually to bind him and bring him before the Roman rulers who would represent God in Christ, in finding Christ guilty of our sins. And so he, first of all, we know he stayed most of the time about 60 miles away from Jerusalem, maybe three or four days journey up and around the Sea of Galilee so that there would be as little 
uh, knowledge of what he was what was going on that would be brought back to the uh, Jewish leaders as possible although they sent their spies up and they did get reports but secondly uh, he did not want it uh, declared too broadly that he was uh, that uh, that he was what what he was doing because the, he knew that this would only make the J Jewish leaders more jealous, more envious than ever, more determined to try to have him killed. Now, on the other side of the coin, we find that when he was ready to go to the cross, he went to Bethany, which is right outside of uh, the temple walls, the, the, uh, Jerusalem, just a, a very short uh, uh, distance, and there very publicly he raised Lazarus from the dead. And at that time, the city of Jerusalem was filled with people who had come there from all over Israel to celebrate the Passover. And so this was done with a great emphasis uh, or in such a way that it would be very, very well known and known. And this would incite the Jews to want to have him killed more than ever. Then on top of it, right after that, remember the Sunday before he went to the cross, he came riding deliberately, very deliberately. He came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey and was being acclaimed as king of the Jews, and uh, which again would just so intensify the hatred and the envy of the Jews. He was, in other words, Christ was setting them up so that they would be determined, be, de be determined, Christ had, this Jesus had to be killed. And that would fit perfectly into God's timeline because it was on this Passover day that was only a few days away from these events that I'm just describing that Christ was to be the Passover lamb. So at least we know that much about it, that, that it all fits into God's timeline, that everything has to happen in exact accord with what God had planned all the way from the very beginning. The whole timeline of history that, that is, unfolds as we read the Bible, leading right up until the very last day, was all carefully pre-planned. It's just like today, for example. Christ cannot come one day earlier than what he has planned from, from before the foundation of the world. Uh, the gods, uh, everything that has been planned must be carried out with meticulous care. And, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, this at least is one of the reasons. There may be other reasons why, why he didn't want his name uh, why this uh, to be known everywhere, but this is one of the big reasons. Okay, but, the last question, please, Brother Camping. Yes. I don't remember the chapter, but when Jesus said that he could not do miracles. That was and, in, that's in Luke chapter 4. Correct. Uh, Can you because, explain why he couldn't do it? Was it because of the unbelief? Well, it's, uh, God is using that language in order to underscore the rank unbelief of the people of his own city. Uh, he came to Nazareth where he had lived almost 35 years. He was known only as a craftsman, a son of, uh, of Joseph, uh, uh, who of course was his stepfather, not his actual father, but he was known as the son of Joseph and of Mary, and that he was a carpenter or a brick mason or some kind of a craftsman. And here he comes preaching. And, and, and we find that, uh, that uh, uh, they were so, so upset with him that in verse 9 of Luke 4, they brought him to, uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, uh, no, wait a minute. Uh, uh, that's, that's not what I'm... Uh, they were so upset with him that... Uh, uh, where, where, am I, where am I looking for here? Uh, they, they were uh, that that they wanted to kill him, and we read in there uh, as we went on, as we go on, that uh, that. Uh, hmm. I'm saying this is in Luke chapter four, and I can't 
find it right at this moment. Uh, but uh, it's either in, well, I'm sure it's Luke chapter 4. <laughs> uh, because the study that we were working on... Yeah, they, 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 yeah, here it is in verse 29. And they, all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, this was in Nazareth, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon the city was built that they might cast him down headlong. And in this uh, context, in one of the other other uh, uh, other places, he is saying that he could not do many mighty things there because of their unbelief. And, uh, and uh, that, of course, is uh, mysterious. Of course, God can do what he wants to do, but uh, I'm not sure exactly how we can explain that and I I'm not going to try because I'm afraid I'll be speculating right because um so basically um, this miracle could have been the miracle of salvation or the miracle of was it depending on their faith for him to actually do anything this is what I'm trying to make sure I clear get a clarification we don't have Jesus do not have to have our faith to do what his will is oh oh absolutely not absolutely not but you know there is this principle that still runs through. On the one hand, God tells us to repent and to begin to believe the Word of God, believe the Gospel. We talked about that earlier. Uh, and as we do so, we, put our, we find we are in a place where God can save us if He so pl is pleased to do that. It doesn't mean we're going to become saved. It doesn't guarantee our salvation. It doesn't contribute to our salvation. But this is, the, this is the way God works out his salvation plan. On the other hand, we read in the Bible repeatedly about those who would, uh, would, uh, would hear the word of God, but they would not really listen to it. And they had no desire to be obedient to it. They did not want to be obedient to it. And we find that they have no encouragement of salvation. All we hear is, if you continue in that path, you are on your way to hell. And, and this happened to be the attitude of the people to a high degree in Nazareth. And so, uh, now, how God works out his salvation plan through all of that, that's God's business altogether. We can't enter into it. But I'll tell you, if we, if we scorn the Bible, if we uh, 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 pay no attention to the Bible, if we uh, are happy with what we think we know and, and we're not about to try to learn more from the Word of God, uh, then we have put ourselves in a place where there is not the slightest encouragement that we're on or that there's a possibility of salvation. There may be. But we don't get any encouragement from the Bible at all, from God himself. And, and that's not the place to be at all. We want to be in a place where, where uh, God is saying, believe on me. And, and uh, that is, trust what, my, what the Bible is saying and repent. And, and then hopefully, hopefully, you too might become a child of God. Thank you very much, Brother Kathy. Thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Good evening Brother Camping. Yes. I would like to look at Genesis chapter 4, verse um, 4 through 7, with the emphasis on verse 7. Yeah, well, there's talking about the sacrifice of Cain and Abel. And, uh, and uh, uh, Cain's sacrifice was not accepted of God, and Abel's was. And then the Lord said unto Cain, Cain, uh, Cain and Cain was very angry because his sacrifice was not accepted. Now, we don't know how he knew it was not accepted. We don't know that. But we do know that God is speaking directly here to Cain. They didn't have the Bible. God was still bringing 
messages directly to individuals. And maybe God told Cain it wasn't acceptable. We don't know. But, but Cain was very angry. And so God, Christ, or God said to Cain, Why art thou angry, and why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Okay, Brother Camping, I called before, and I, and I was showing you that this was a picture of God's salvation plan. Abel being the man of God, the elect, Cain being the man of sin, and God um, offering him the chance at salvation by saying, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And a caller called last night and he said he was confused. And you pointed him to verse 12 about how people love the world and things, but that's not what I raised the question over. I told you the emphasis was on verse 7 and the salvation um, plan. Well, the no. fact is, no one will do well unless God has saved them. We have to read this statement in the light of the whole Bible. Nobody can be pleasing to God altogether unless their sins have been paid for. Christ has saved them. And, and God is the only one who knows whom, whose sins he has paid for. And, uh, and so, it isn't, uh, God is not suggesting here at all that if you do well, that is going to uh, be a contribution to the fact that then I will save you. Or if you do become saved, that was a contribution toward uh, you becoming saved. That is not possible. Or, uh, the Bible is very clear that all the work of saving was done long before we were born. It was done long before Adam and Eve uh, were born. It was uh, it, it, Christ is the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the earth, and we were chosen. Those who are to become saved were chosen by God from the foundation of the world. Would you turn to First Peter, chapter two? First Peter, chapter two, yeah. verse three. Well, let's look at that a moment. First Peter, chapter, chapter two. two. Verse 3, there right. we read, he, If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now, uh, he, uh, three through chap um, verse 3 through 7. Yeah, well, if ye have tasted the Lord is gracious, to whom coming of, uh, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house. He's talking here about those whom God has saved. Right. We, we are the ones who have, t if we have truly become saved, we have really tasted the Word of God and have experienced the grace of God because the grace of God is the free gift of salvation. Can you continue? Right. Yeah, wherefore, also, it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, that's the Lord Jesus, elect precious and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded now the ones he's talking about he that believeth on him are those who have become saved and as a consequence of their salvation one of the works that shows up in their life a very dominant work is that they have a profound trust in Christ as their Savior. Again... Could you read verse 7? And then, unto you, therefore, which be believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word. In other words, either Christ becomes our Savior, he is our Savior, or He is our judge. He is a stone of stumbling. And that's what he was saying to Cain. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for calling and sharing. You're welcome. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Kenton. How are you this evening? Go Hello? Ahead. Yes, go ahead with your call. Yes, I have um, three quick questions. You had said about the churches earlier this evening, um, 
that none of them, like all of them, are of Satan, whether they speak in tongues or not. And my question is, the scripture, I don't know the exact reference, but the scripture where it says about um, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, doesn't that mean we're supposed to like go to church? Uh, well, you see, you're quoting from Matthew, from Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Okay. Hebrews 10, verse 25. And the context there is not talking about the church. It's talking about what happens after we come out of the church. It's talking about our day. Okay. And it is talking about, uh, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves. The word together is not, uh, should not be there. The translators had, of course, did not understand what we know today about the details of the end of time as we know it and so they put the word together there which should never have been there the word okay. the word is simply uh, are the assembling of ourselves as is the habit of uh, uh, or uh, and, uh, don't forsake as the habit of some is and and exhorting not one another uh, it's just exhorting who or and the word exhorting could be uh, 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 comforting comforting ourselves it's talking about ourselves and how do we ex uh, comfort ourselves and how do we assemble ourselves well as we as we uh, are able to to have dialogue with Christ himself as we worship individually him as we pray to him uh, uh, and that's our conversation talking to him and as he talks with us through his word that is the focus of that verse. It has okay. nothing to do with the assembling together of a congregation. Okay, and also about with the tongues and everything, right? And you said that, you know, no one will get a direct message from, from God. So, like, how do we know about what our purpose is? Like, like how, okay, like with you, with Family Radio, how you were led by God or directed by God to, to start that. Like, if we don't get a direct message from him, how would we know, like, to do something like that? Well, I never heard, got, uh, heard a word from God saying, look, why don't you start family radio? Uh, now, God works in people's lives, but not with a spoken word, not with a, a, a uh, articulated word of any kind as people want to hear from God through a vision or a voice or a tongue they want some kind of a of, of articulated word and God does not speak that way we know that as we uh, live out our life and are obedient to God and if we uh, are blessed in our obedience we know that it can be God working in us to will and to do of his good pleasure but he doesn't give us any divine message no articulated word of or verbalized word of any kind the only place we're going to hear god speak to us is through the words of the bible and that will never never be violated but thank you for and calling divine the healings real quickly divine healings well you see um, now the, the, divine healing you know, th this is really a shame, a total shame. There are churches that focus on, you know, Christ came to give you whole bodies, and, and they try to prove that they can heal this disease and that disease. Well, if that is the message of the gospel, it's a total disaster, a total disaster, because everyone who claims that they had a divine healing eventually dies. We find these healers of the past uh, who had great uh, people, assemblies of people and claimed they were healing people left and right. And the next thing, they get cancer and they die. Uh, there, uh, there is no divine healing. Uh, uh, the, the, all of the healing that the disciples did and Christ did were simply portraits or pictures showing that even as a person in that day, that is, it's recorded in the Bible, received his sight or was healed from being a leper or was raised from the dead. That is a picture of the fact that so we are spiritually ill. We are spiritually blind. We are spiritually dead. And the gospel can give us the, 
the wonderful healing of spiritual life, which is infinitely more wonderful, and it's eternal in character. This whole business of healing services is a travesty on the Word of God. It is mocking the Word of God. It is uh, substituting something that man likes and yet has no value of any kind insofar as that person's salvation is concerned. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Tampa. How are you this evening? Very well, thank you. Uh, yes, my name is Gene Robinson. I'm calling from Pensacola, New Jersey. I would like to know when uh, will you have the banquet this year in Cherry Hill? I have no idea. Uh, others make those arrangements, but I think it's in October, maybe. Oh, can I ask you another question? Yes. Oh, okay. When we read in hymns and the, and, the, and the word church come up, do we omit church and say fellowship or something else? Oh, no. When we see the word church, we have to look at the context. If it is talking about a local church, well, we, 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 uh, oh, oh, when we're singing a hymn. Yes. Yeah. Well, we can, stay, uh, we can still uh, say church? Uh, no, we have to be thinking if that word church appears. He's not, t uh, God is, uh, talk, uses the word church in two ways. Mm -hmm. He use it in, uses it in speaking of the kingdom of God that is, consists of all those who have truly becoming, have become saved. That is the eternal church, and God is still building that eternal church. That is the church against which the gates of hell cannot prevail. Yeah. But, but when the, when we see the word church, we, uh, uh, the, it may be that it's, it's, at the time the hymn was written, the hymn writer I was thinking about the local congregation, but we know no, whatever is written in that hymn about the local congregation, that cannot apply any longer because the local congregation is no longer under any blessing from God. So we can't, we can't say church while we sing in the hymn? Well, it's, it's better even not to even sing those verses. Uh, uh, that's one thing. Uh, but, but, for example, if we read, we sing the song, The Church is One Foundation, yes. Jesus Christ our Lord. Yes. Well, that is true of the eternal church. Oh, I see Christ what you're is the foundation of that. Right. It's not talking about the local congregation. I see. Only one that's talking about the local congregation. We we omit it. Yeah, we, we, that's one way to handle it. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you for caring and sharing, and good night. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. I was. I have quite, um, quite a few questions for you. Um, you believed that the Holy Spirit can choose a certain individual to to speak to uh, anybody at this time, or like at this at this um, age. And um, I believe uh, this is uh, the other one. Um, Abel and Cain. I believe uh, the Lord accepted. Uh, the sacrifice of uh, Abel because uh, he chose the best fruits of his uh, garden to sacrifice it to God. Because um, that, that's what I read, that's what I, I I was reading about. Um, can you answer the first question, please? Well, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get what uh, what was the verse you were speaking about. Oh, I was asking you. Did you did you believe that the Holy Spirit would choose choose a certain individual to? To do any something a miracle, perhaps. Well, n no human being is going to do a miracle. That's impossible. A miracle is where God sets aside the normal rules by which He governs the universe and and changes that law. Like when Jesus walked on water, He had to set aside the law of gravity. When God multiplied, when Christ multiplied the loaves and the fish, he had to set aside all kinds of laws. When he raised a person from the dead, he had to set aside all kinds of, of uh, phys physical laws that, by which he governs the universe. Now, temporarily, from time to time, that did happen while Jesus and the apostles were on earth because God was using that to demonstrate 
uh, the miraculous nature of salvation. But, but uh, uh, once the Bible was completed, that, is, that will never be expected again. There are no miracles except one gigantic miracle, and that's only performed by God, and that's the miracle when God gives someone a brand new resurrected soul uh, because that person had become saved by God. That is, all of his sins had been paid for, and God has, got to, has to prepare that person to be with him eternally in heaven. And so he does it in two steps. First of all, uh, when he gives us, him a new resurrected soul, a dramatic miracle, and then on the last day when Christ returns, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, he gives that person a brand new resurrected body. Another tremendous miracle. But uh, there, uh, there are no other miracles going on in the world. Now, all kinds of people claim miracles uh, because they are looking for a different kind of a gospel. They're following a different gospel than that of the Bible. But we have to go to our next caller. But, but before that, we'll go to our message. We're continuing with the Open Forum, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Um, I have two questions and an observation from last night. But my first question was, I, you know, I was reading uh, again about John the Baptist, and I thought about something in my studies last night, and it was that he, in part of the scripture where God is explaining that he was uh, addressing Herod and his adulterous relationship with um, his sister-in-law. And I was curious, as a believer, I know we're taught not to look at others' sins and you know, rather look at what's going on in our personal life. And I'm curious, because John is like us, why the Lord allowed him to uh, discuss sin so openly in the marketplace. Are you talking about John the Baptist? That, yes. uh, that, uh, and what is your question about John the Baptist? When he was pointing out uh, Herod's adulterous relationship... Oh, yes. He's, he's criticizing Herod because uh, he was in an adulterous relationship, yes. And, you know, are, are the prophets, the Old Testament prophets of God, because we're not, you know, because John, uh, John was also sin-laden and resurrected, just like all believers through time, but I'm curious why God allowed that to be an example. Well, that, that, that's a very curious situation. We do know that God, Christ said of all the prophets, uh, John the Baptist was the greatest, and so... Christ really looked upon him as he looked upon all of the Old Testament prophets. And God did employ them as, uh, as uh, to, because remember, they didn't have the whole Bible as we have the whole Bible. At that time, they did not have the New Testament at all. They just had the Old Testament. And so God not only spoke to the people through his written word, which very few people knew very much about and did not have copies of or anything, but he also spoke through prophets that arose, and John the Baptist was distinctly one of those prophets. So even as uh, Jeremiah, for example, came to the, the king of Judah and, and uh, pointed out God's judgment upon him for this sin or that sin, or uh, Elijah came to a king and did the same, and so on, or and to the populace also of Israel. So John the Baptist legitimately was was had that same role. The Bible was not yet completed. Now, now that the Bible is completed, we know that, for example, during the Church Age, God gave the uh, the, uh, th the rule to the elders and deacons and the pastor to have spiritual oversight over the congregation. And so uh, they, could <coughs> they could warn the congregation about this or that. And in fact, they could, ex excuse me, they could actually excommunicate 
a person from the congregation who was not who was seriously violating the law of God. But now that we're past the church age, there is no human being. There is no human being that has a right to go around and pointing his point his finger at anybody and say, "Look, because of your sins, uh, uh, God is going to send you to hell." This is not the role. The role is to tell everybody we're sinners. We're under the wrath. The, the world is under the wrath of God, and we're to repent of our sins and cry to God for mercy because God is very merciful and, and judgment day is coming. But it's, uh, we, we, don't, we don't have a role like John the Baptist did. We have the whole Bible. It's the Bible now that declares we're sinners, not the mouth of a prophet such as John the Baptist uh, was. Yeah, and that was just leading to my uh, second question in that, you know, before many, many departed from the church, and this is, you know, the, the majority of churches at this point that seem to desensitize um, uh, parishioners from the fact that sin and hell are very real, and they're, you know, they are found as living instructions in the Word of God, and now that we're at the church age, you know, are we to be sensitive, you know, in, in terms of saying, you know, Satan is a uh, abomination of desolation, and you're following Satan as you sit there and hear false ministers? Um, well, well, you know, isn't it interesting? If we look at a typical church today, number one, they do not understand that the whole Bible, every word in the Bible, came from the mouth of God. There is no church that understands that. They believe that it's the Bible is infallible, but God used Luke, uh, men like Luke and Paul and Moses and so on, to write the Bible, and, and, and yet they do not believe that God takes full responsibility as every word coming from his mouth. Secondly, they do not understand that the whole Bible is the law of God and must be obeyed and has total authority. That is not understood. Virtually no church clearly understands that there's absolutely nothing, even faith or anything else that make a, can, can make a contribution toward our salvation that is not understood. Almost all the churches believe that you can divorce for fornication and so on. And, and most of the churches violate the Lord's Day, uh, the Sunday Sabbath. They, have, they don't understand that that altogether is a day uh, for spiritual activity and we should not be engaging in the kind of things that the world is engaging in on that day. And we can keep going down the road, uh, down the line of, of things after thing after thing that you cannot find in the local congregation because what even, the, in fact, the Bible says this, that even what they did understand is being taken away from them so that as we go along, uh, they are becoming more and more uh, in rebellion against the authority of the Word of God and establishing their own ideas of what the gospel really is. And so uh, the, uh, the, the church has no spiritual authority because uh, God has departed from them and they're just existing there uh, under the wrath of God. God is preparing those who remain there for their time at the judgment throne. They are actually worshiping Satan when they think they're worshiping Christ. God is sending a strong delusion upon them so that they are uh, are ready to believe more and more wrong teachings and so on. It's, it's, it's really, really, it's, the church is in a shambles today. And lastly, you had a caller last night, and I don't think you got to pick up this one part of his uh, statement. He was feeling a little bit down because his grandmother has passed away, and he had given you a scripture in John. But um, my question to you, and, and hopefully he's listening, and many listeners are out there who who are going through um, troubled times, either in persecution or in transitioning when they're leaving their church and 
understanding, you know, beginning to understand their living walk uh, in God and the same relationship that he had with Abraham, that one-on-one relationship is not, uh, you know, some intangible, unsearchable thing, but everything is found in the Word and that we should be comforted through our despair or anything that we're going through that, you know, that relationship is nothing far, far away. It's very, very close uh, in the Word. And well, excuse what me. I wanted, what yeah. I wanted you to address is, could you talk a little bit about that? Well, the uh, fact is, excuse me, the fact is that the final answer that I can give is, read your Bible. It is, the Bible is where God is speaking to us. Read it slowly, carefully, prayerfully. Uh, trying to be understand what you can and praying for understanding where you can't understand and always with a view uh, that you have an intense desire to be obedient to it. And the Bible is the living word. That is where God is finally going to bring blessing. Not because you hear something from me or on family radio. It's because you are reading the Bible. And this this is the... This is the, uh, remember what we started out with, uh, Jesus came preaching, believe the gospel, and the gospel is the whole word of God. You don't, it, don't believe a teacher, believe the gospel. Re- start reading your Bible carefully, carefully, recognizing every word came from the mouth of God, and it's important, and praying, oh God, have mercy on me, I I know I'm in trouble, and yet I'm so thankful that today there are a great multitude being saved, and maybe, maybe, maybe I too could be one of these. And so the bottom line finally is get back into the Word of God. That is where uh, you come in direct relationship with Christ because uh, the Bible is right for your, as you read the Bible you are hearing right from the mouth of God and how God works all that out that's God's business I don't know how he works his word in the lives of any individual that's God's business but I do know that that is the place where we want to get our attention fixed more and more but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Harold. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, Matthew chapter 24. Yes. Could you give us your current understanding on verses 17 through 20? And I'll take my answer off the air. 17 to 20. Let me look yes, at sir. that. Thank you. Matthew 24, verse 17. There we read... Uh, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Now, Matthew 24, we must remember, is speaking about this 23-year period from everything we know in the Bible, uh, according to God's timeline of history as it's revealed to us in the Bible. Matthew 24, the whole chapter, is speaking about the final 23 years of the history of the world, of which the final 17 years of are the time when God is bringing in the final harvest, a great and glorious harvest of believers. It's a time when God is making his word more glorious than ever before. And to be on the house stuff has to do with sending out the gospel, telling the gospel to the world. And, 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 uh, don't come down into the house, and, uh, and the house normally we, th- we think of as the house of God, the local congregations. Don't get back into them at all, because Christ is not saving there at all. Stay on the house stuff. Stay out there in the world. We're bringing the gospel wherever you, ever you are. Likewise, verse 18, neither let him which is in, the, is in the field, and the field, remember, is a symbol for the world. Uh, uh, those who are in the world return back to take his clothes. In other words, we're busy as all get out. We're, we are, we are, do not go back into our churches in order to get 
the spiritual stimulation or in order to straighten out a doctrine. We stay out there in the world. We have in our hand the Word of God, and that is everything. That is the glorious Word. And then woe unto them that are with child, and, the, and lo to them that give suck in those days. And you know, when you think about it, literally, in a world of more than six billion people, about one-third of the world, and this is from the World Al- Almanac, this didn't come from the Bible, but it, it is uh, indicates that there is at least some knowledge in the world about how many people uh, believe they have some kind of a relationship with Christ. And only, normally at this time in history, it would mean that they have been under the authority in some way, either at a mission station or in a local congregation, under the authority of a local congregation. And that one-third, uh, about two billion people, if they are remaining there, they are setting their children, their families up for hell because they fondly believe that that is where their little children or their young people will be hearing the gospel and hopefully God will bless that and, and, be, and save them. And, but the fact is God is not saving there. And those poor children are, are thinking that they're in the right place to become saved and there's no possibility as long as they're in the, in the remaining in the church. And so woe unto them that are with child and to give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath. And that again, the winter time is a time when in the churches there is no spiritual growth of any kind. Winter is a time in our northern hemisphere where most of the people of the world live when there is, uh, it is, uh, there is no uh, growing season at all. It's the time when uh, everything is, is, appears dead. And that is the character of the local churches at this time. It is winter time. And yet it is the Sabbath. Now the Sabbath, that ties back into the fact of the seventh day Sabbath and the seventh day Sabbath is, is a sign pointing to the fact that we do not any work at all uh, in order to become saved. And it is in this day where it is winter within the congregation so that nobody is becoming saved there. Yet out in the world, it is the Sabbath because the true gospel of salvation is being heralded, is being uh, being sent out into the world, that we don't do anything to achieve our salvation. We simply wait upon God and, and, uh, and uh, follow the words of Jesus that we repent and believe the gospel. That is, we, we trust that the gospel is true, and therefore, when it commands us to pray for salvation, we pray for salvation. When it tells us that there's a great multitude that are being saved, we believe it is so, because the Bible says so. And, and when it tells us to wait upon the Lord, uh, because there's nothing that you can do to get yourself saved, we say, all, all right, I'm waiting upon the Lord. Oh, Lord, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. But thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Brother Camping. I was wondering when the Bible discusses the returning of Christ, is this going to be a literal returning or a figurative returning in our hearts and souls? Oh, this when it talks about the visible return of the Lord Jesus Christ, every eye shall see him. That is literally going to occur, and probably about four years from now, from everything we can know from the Bible timeline as we presently understand the Bible, uh, and that will mark the very end of the existence of this universe. At that time, God will bring all of his believers with him, to be with him away from this earth, All those who are not saved will stand for judgment and be removed into a place called hell, and God will destroy this whole universe and recreate it, a new heaven and a new earth, 
where he will live forever with the with those who he has saved and so this is all of that is very very literal and it's going to happen in our lifetime and that is the lifetime of almost everyone presently living on the earth even though of course every year millions of people die well thank you thank you for calling and sharing and uh, shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum yes mr Camper. would you please look at uh first corinthians the 14th chapter the first through the fourth verse uh, first corinthians what chapter 14th chapter 14th yes all yeah, right first corinthians and what verse one through four yes well follow after love and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye prophesy, that is, declare the word of God. For the he that speaketh in a tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. There was the, this phenomenon going on in the church at Corinth for just a few years, where they would, would uh, say words that were in some kind of a heavenly language that did not, that did not uh, edify the congregation at all. For no man understandeth him, it says. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. And that was possible in that day because the Bible was not yet completed. But he that prophesieth, that is, who speaks words in, that he hears from God, and he speaks in an audible way, uh, in, a, in, a, in words that can be understood, speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in a tongue edifieth himself. He knows he's having a wonderful experience. And like I say, that only happened for just a few years just in the church at Corinth. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. And I would that ye all speak, spoke with tongues that has had that blessing, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. In other words, it's the words that can be understood in our language that edifies the congregation, not when somebody is speaking in some kind of a heavenly language that only will make that person feel good because he uh, believes that God is speaking through him. But that whole phenomenon had only to do with that short period time in history that all went out of the window. It doesn't exist any longer. Once God, a few years later, completed the writing of the Bible and said we're not to add to the words of the prophecy of this yeah, book. What I'm interested in is about prophesizing. Are we still supposed to be prophesizing? Every time what we... What does prophesizing mean, though? Maybe that's what it's wrong. Oh, okay, that's a good question. To prophesy means to declare the Word of God. Every true believer that is sharing the gospel with someone is a prophet. Like we read in Acts 2, uh, that your young men and your old men will will prophesy and your young and your maidens will prophesy that is every true believer is commissioned and mandated and qualified by god whether a man woman or child to be a prophet to declare the riches of the word of god to others and the moment we do that we are prophesying now there are those who want to claim well i'm a latter-day prophet They're, they claim uh, for themselves and that's, that's nonsense. The fact is every true believer is a, is a prophet, uh, and, and this will continue right up until the last day. Can they also be in the congregation and be prophesying? I'm sorry? Could, could, could they, that individual, can he be in the mix of a class or a group and prophesy? Well, no, because in that congregation, that is, that, that's off limits to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not present there. The only, uh, 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 for example, I could go into a church, and I uh, am a true believer, and if they would allow me, I could speak to them about the gospel. But I would know that while I'm in that church, there's going to be no blessing to what I'm saying because the Holy Spirit is not 
present there to apply that word. The pastor, for example, can speak a lovely, bring a lovely sermon uh, uh, from the Bible, very biblically doing so, and yet it has uh, it has no spiritual impact upon the congregation because the Holy Spirit is not there to apply the word of God to anybody's heart or life. And that's okay. why we have to get out of the churches, but outside of the churches, there's an entirely different matter. As people hear the word of God, uh, they, uh, they, the possibility of salvation is very, very great. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our last call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yeah, hello. Um, Mr. Camping? Yes. Yeah, okay. Can you hear me very well? Yes, very well. Okay. I have a, uh, first a comment and then a question real quick. All right. Uh, about a month ago, a woman had called in and questioned you on Matthew 27, 9. And um, the reading was that uh, that there was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet, saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver and the price of him that was valued. Um, she had asked about that, and it caused me to look into it because you, you, you didn't explain it real well that you said it was spoken of and might not have been written. But the word spoken drove me to Hosea. If you want to read this, it's Hosea 11 or Hosea 12.9, or 12.10. Hosea 12.10. There we read in Hosea 12.10. I have also spoken by the prophets, and I have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Now, the word spoken there in Matthew 27 is actually uh, a rendering of the similitude here as we're told in um, Hosea. It's, it's as what uh, the prophet did with a spiritual meaning to it. Right. Uh, would I be right in that? No, no. You made a jump there. That's not. You can't associate similitude with the fact that God spoke. Now, it's true. There are places in the New Testament that says that, and there is a quotation that is found in the Old Testament, and they say this, and it says this was spoken by Isaiah or whoever it was. But you see, the fact is that, that Jeremiah uh, said a lot more words than what we find written in the Bible. And, True. and God was giving him messages, and what is written in the Bible is what God wanted us to hear, but and we do not find that particular that particular uh, uh, those particular words from the, anywhere in the Bible as coming from Jeremiah. And so, but that doesn't mean that he did not speak those words. Uh, we have to bear in mind that Jeremiah said more words than what we read in the Bible. And so, there, it's uh, we we can't fudge, we can't push on the Bible and try to make it say something it's not saying. It just simply says it was not spoken by Jeremiah. So, okay. Uh, that is, it was spoken by Jeremiah, but that doesn't mean necessarily that everything he spoke was written in the Bible. But now I've come to the end. I have to say good night until our next open forum. May the Lord richly bless you. Good night.